We look forward to inviting um, Mark McSpadden uh, and uh, Joe Everstein up on stage. Now, earlier when I think uh, was Wade was doing his Saber intro, he talked about a chance encounter um, of, uh, of an American Airlines executive and an IBM executive on the same plane. And we certainly want to take advantage of chance encounters. It's always great to come to a conference and connect and talk to somebody and find that little disruptive nugget uh, of an idea. These two guys um, don't leave anything to chance. They look at everything that we do digitally. They follow a lot of the emerging technologies. They dabble with everything. And they try and look for ways that we can apply it uh, to different travel problems in the industry. So, um, we'll invite out on stage uh, Mark and Joe to talk a little bit about some of the future technologies that Sabre is watching because we want to leave nothing to chance. Guys? Hi, good morning or maybe good afternoon if you're watching on the live stream. We're excited to be here today to talk about uh, the future of business travel. I know that we've been talking a lot over the last couple of days about where we're currently investing, where we've come from as Sabre as a company, and kind of what we're looking at immediately next. This talk is all about kind of what's further out there. As Jan has said, I'm Mark McSpadden. I lead a group called Sabre Labs within Sabre. Sabre Labs looks at trends and technologies that we think will impact travel over the next three to five to seven years and we try to make those as real as we can uh, for our customers and for our businesses. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joe Kim, or Joe Everstein. I am the head of innovation for Sabre Travel Network in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And you know, apart from Mark here, I think I have probably have the coolest and best jobs in the world because I get to touch and, and experiment with the latest technologies in terms of hardware, but also software, and then think about how can we take this technology, bring it back into travel, and create sensible and useful applications for it. And I want to extend a special thank you to the events team for inviting me and having me here. So thank you very much. And so while it may seem like we're kind of isolated and having really super cool jobs, uh, when I look across Sabre as a whole, that's actually not the picture that I see. I see a, a, an ecosystem uh, built around innovation. Uh, people like Joe within Travel Network, and we see the same in our solutions businesses, focused on uh, innovation and the next things coming that affect those, those businesses. Within our technology organization, we have a group called Sabre Research uh, that holds a lot, of a, a lot of our patents from Sabre come from that group, also a lot of the work of the initial work on the Dev Studios API came out of that group as well. We have employee-driven innovation. In Southlake, it's a, a, group, a group called Bring It, but we have groups all across the globe uh, who are focused on creating events so that we hear from all of our employees and those innovative ideas bubble up and we take the best of them and push them as far as we can. Those include events like Hack Days and uh, Pitch Competitions, which we actually just finished up um, in Southlake. Uh, two weeks ago. And then uh, my group that looks kind of across the whole industry to see what are the kind of the macro trends and how do we bring those back to Sabre. And the reason that we spend so much time on this is because this acceleration of technology is getting faster and faster. That feeling that you have that technology is progressing at a more rapid rate, this is the chart for that feeling. You didn't know that your feelings had charts. Um, but they do, and this is that one. So this is a chart that shows a U.S. technology adoption uh, from 10% household adoption to 75% household adoption and how long it took. So when we look at something like the landline phone, some, so over 40 years, then we look at radio, 12 years, smartphone, six years. So Mark, you say smartphone, six years. So explain to me, what does this chart mean really? What does it say? Is it, you know, what is, uh, what is uh, sort of adoption rate here? So, so, so it's from 10 to 10% 10 to 75% of household usage. Okay, so 75%. Now, smartphone reached 75% in six years. And today, the technology adoption is coming at a velocity never seen before. So, in fact, there is one million new smartphone users every day. And that is three times the amount of babies being born every day. 
That's, that's kind of amazing, isn't it? And as you can see on the chart here, tablet took about three years to, to reach um, adoption rate of 75%. Now I wonder, so you say t 10 to 75%. What, what about the technologies and the trends that doesn't reach 10%? Should we still be looking at that? You, you know, that's what, Joe, I know you do a little bit. That's what we do in the lab is that we experiment with a lot of technologies because not all of them will reach a 10% adoption. In fact, if you've been in the ideation lounge, you know, we have green stickers for technologies that you're excited about. We also have red stickers for technologies that you're not sure are really going to make it or have an impact on travel. But what, what's important is because the technology is moving so quickly, is that we have to experiment with these technologies before they reach 10% adoption. Because once they do, if we look at something like smartwatches uh, from yesterday mentioned around 20% adoption, once they start hitting that threshold, they hit mass adoption very quickly. And so if you haven't been experimenting with these technologies beforehand or have a partner that have, um, it's very hard to catch up because by the time you catch up, everybody's already uh, playing on that field. And Mark, before you move on, I would, yeah, well, <laughs> so, yeah, well, never mind. I would like to make a poll in the room because I talked about smartphone adoption and, you know, it reaches 75%. Now, there's an interesting fact about that because as you start using a smartphone, you usually carry more than one device with you. So I would like to make a quick poll in the room here. How many of you are carrying more than one device wherever you go? Hands up. Okay. So how many of you are carrying more than three devices when you go around? Four? Five? OK, so I think it's safe to say that's about three devices in average. And that's also the global average that an you know, uh, uh, average smartphone user usually carries three devices. And recently, I read a study about people in Singapore. And 1% of the smartphone users in Singapore claims that they are carrying more than nine devices when they travel. Wow. Anybody, anybody carrying nine devices on them right now? <laughs> no, nobody? OK. And so we, we talk about technology like that. And sometimes when you hear about nine devices or how fast this technology is coming, it, it feels really abstract. It's hard to get your head around. So what we found is, is really helpful is to pick a point in time and an event that you can wrap your head around and start to, to frame this conversation of the future in technology. Um, so what we've done is we'd like you to think about this event right here in the year 2022, seven years from now. So take just a second, do some quick math on what your age will be in seven years. Um, what, what, uh, what, what are your family situation? What do you think you're carrying around with you? What do you think you're doing in life? Because the world can change a lot in seven years. Yeah, that's true, Mark. And, but before we do that, before we go into the future and talk about what we believe is coming, I would like to take a step back and rewind seven years ago. What did the world look like seven years ago? So we had the second generation of the iPhone coming out, but there wasn't an app store. Can you imagine a world without that? Come on. Netflix was run, but at the time, Netflix was a really, really cool movie renting company. They would, sell, they would send DVDs to your home, and when you watched the movie, you would send it snail mail back to Netflix. In fact, they had streaming services back then, but the adoption was close to zero. It was a time when Continental and United, US Airways and American were separate airlines. There was no Uber. There was no Airbnb. Things that we take for granted in travel today. And, and so we, we want to think about Connect 2022, and through this conversation, Joe and I are going to have, think about the people that are changing that impact that event, the places that are changing that impact event, and of course, some of the technologies that are changing. And so some of these things, may you may have heard of them. They may not be new to you, but they may be new to, the person, new to the person next to you. I love this quote by William Gibson that says, the future has arrived, it's just not evenly distributed yet. Yeah, and that's, that is so true. And you know, I can totally relate to that because as you can see, I'm Swedish. I grew up in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> 
And in Sweden, we actually do our income tax online. You can do it on a smartphone. You can do it on the web. We're, we have a feature called the bank ID. With a bank ID, I can identify my electron, myself electronically in many different instances. So that, that's really nice technology out there. Now, a couple of days ago, I was flying home back from Amsterdam, and I was trying to download my mobile boarding pass, and it says, no, it, it doesn't work. You have to go to a machine and print a paper boarding pass. And I'm like, what? There is technology for it. What's the reason why you can't use a mobile boarding pass? Another good example is that there are billions of dollars flowing through mobile devices every single year. Yet in some areas, at least in our remit in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, you can't pay for high value items simply because of the risk of theft. So, so those are just a few examples of how the distribution of the future varies depending on where you are, who you're interacting with. And part of this talk is to kind of even out this distribution even for just 45 minutes. So let's start by talking about uh, the people that we see that impact uh, Connect 2022. I'm gonna leave this up here. Those are my daughters, they're adorable. <laughs> okay, so we can, <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. And they're not quite the future business traveler of 2022. Uh, but the, the business travel of 2022 is different than what we see today. This is a chart from Mary Meeker's Internet Trends Report, which is a great resource on what's going on today in the world. And what it shows is the shift, the generational shift in the U.S. workforce uh, from 2000 uh, to 2015, just 15 years. You see this massive shift of boomers in blue going from 48%. Uh, down to 31%, and the millennial generation, or Gen Y, are going from 6% uh, to actually the, being to the majority of the workforce right now at 35%. And while we like to talk about millennials, you're probably tired of hearing about millennials. They're not the only generation in town. And it's not the latest generation, Mark, because yes. it's just you getting older, right? It's just me getting older, <laughs> unfortunately. So listen to this. The, the latest generation is something called Generation Zero. It's people that are born in 1995 until approximately 2010. And there is another generation, but that's for the 2022 conference, I guess we yeah. talk about that. So <clears throat> on the screen you see a pretty busy infographic that sort of highlights some of the um, things about Generation Zero. And I want to highlight four things on this infographic. The first one being Today, when we talk about tech device usage, we, we can see an average of about four and a half hours in average that you spend on a tech device. Now, Generation Zero, they already spend over 10 and a half hours on a tech device, presumably then a, a, a mobile phone. And that tells us that you know, tech will still be a very central part of our lives and thereby also a very central part in travel. So the second thing I want to mention is that from, a, from an educational perspective, today around 25% of the working sort of population, they have a higher education, a university degree, or something similar. Now, in Generation Zero, this is forecasted to be every other person. That also tells me that the expectations on the services and the applications that we think about developing for this generation are going to be much, much higher. Thirdly, baby boomers, as we call them, these are the guys that actually come before me, before Generation X and Y. They were verbal, they liked to talk, elaborate, discuss things in length. Generation Zero is all, about, is all about visual, it's all about images. Sometimes when you see Gen Z posts, they don't even write what it is. They just assume that people understand what the, what the picture says. You know, a picture says more than a thousand words, so. Anyway, finally, there are changing life stages. Previously, when we as a travel company or, or you as a travel company wanted to target an age group, it would be easy to say, I want to target teenagers or I want to target adults. That was the easy way. Now, in Generation Zero, there are up to five subcategories of adults. So you have the young adults, you have the kippers, Kippers are the young adults still living with their parents. You have the true adults, the career changers, 
and then the downagers. So what I'm saying is that if you want to target adults, it's easy, it's important to focus on one or all of these different subcategories and, and just understand how they, how they operate. And so as we talk about this next generation that will start to, to break into travel and into the workforce over our timeline, thank you for Connect 2022, the, the question we ask ourselves every day is what does this mean for travel and here, what, what does this mean for business travel? So Joe, from a, a Gen X perspective, what, what are you seeing from that generation? Yeah, so I'm Gen X. Thank you very much for highlighting okay. that, Mark. <laughs> so uh, from, I can say that the, the, some of the things that were, were um, prevalent to my generation is that we were used to waiting for things. You know, that was just the way w the world worked. So I would like to call that delayed gratification and also delayed consumption because if, if, if we take a travel scenario, I would call my travel agent book a trip, and then sit around and wait for the paper ticket to be printed, to be sent home to me via mail. Now, I'm also uh, um, from a generation where we would be loyal to brands, we would be loyal to our travel agency, for example. So after being loyal to my travel agent or travel agency for, let's say, 10 to 15 years, I would have the courage to be a bit more personal and say, well, I'm in a bit of a hurry, so I need to fly back to London uh, tomorrow. So I'm going to text my travel agent and say, hey, can you please help me out because I need to go to London tomorrow. And I would expect an, a reply hopefully before tomorrow because I was traveling tomorrow. But I wouldn't necessarily expect to get like an instant reply. Now, I know that you know Mark wouldn't be that patient. He would probably operate a bit differently, right? So maybe a little differently. So we, Gen, Gen Y, the millennial group, you've been told instant gratification a little bit. You've been told they're disloyal to your brand and to your services. I think we chalk that up and travel a lot to their inexperience. I think that as you see them shift as becoming more of the workforce, this generation starts to travel more. They become seasoned travelers and they fall into the same uh, same places that travelers before fell. They realize the advantages of the loyalty program. They realize the advantages of having an agency that knows them and knows their preferences. And so what I think is interesting is that there's this time window right now and over the next several years where the millennial generation decides what their loyalties are going to be. And so as suppliers and as agencies, I think it's a, a great place for you to step in and be able to reach that group and say, this is what we can provide for you. This is the service that you can expect throughout the rest of your career as a traveler. And so I think that's a really unique opportunity that this room has to be able to do that. Yeah, and then coming back to my favorite topic, Generation Zeros. Now, I, I mentioned delayed uh, gratification, delayed consumption. Generation Zero is all about, I want it now. If they don't get it now, they don't want it at all. There's a very good reason why Amazon now is offering same-day delivery, because they know if they don't, they're going to lose out on this entire generation. So let's take the example of, I said, I have been working up a good relationship and, and, and hopefully a, a bit of a status with my travel agent over many, many years. Now a Gen Zero would you know, expect to have that service from start. So it's all about instant gratification. It's all about instant consumption. If you think about one of the biggest, latest phenomena, Snapchat, you take a picture, you send it to a friend, and then it's gone. They don't need to save it. They don't need to see it again because it's consumed. So instant consumption. And in, in the scenario where, where I would feel a bit awkward about being personal and texting my travel agent, they would probably pull up their phone, send a, Snapchat, um, send a WhatsApp to their travel agent and say, hey, dude, I need to be in London tomorrow. When can I go? Can you please confirm now? Emoji, thumbs up. <laughs> I, li I, I like this idea of booking by emoji. Maybe we can, do you think we can get that on the product plan? Maybe? Well, I think we have to ask Wade. That's a, that's a good point. <laughs> so um, to summarize the three generations, it's when, I, when we think about 
which services and applications that we should develop for the future traveler or the future business traveler. It's not what I need and what I want, what Mark wants or what he needs or anyone in the room. It's all about what does Generation Zero need. And it's very interesting. We had a long conversation about this um, yesterday. So I'm from Generation X. I have built up the relationship and, and my status with the travel agency over year and year and year. And you have probably done the same Some, thing, yeah. but over a shorter period of time because as Gen Ys have been hanging out with Gen Xs as myself, they're like, oh, you, you know, you've got good status on the airline. I, I want that too. And then as the Gen Cs see their parents in Mark, they, they say, oh, you have a gold card. I want the gold card, but I don't want to wait for it for, for 10 years. I want it now. <laughs> and that leads us to believe that if we can create services and applications for Generation Zero, you know, we will accommodate for X, Y as well. Yeah, so, so by, by developing for this most demanding generation, you also meet the needs of all the other generations. Kind of an interesting concept that we, we've been discussing. And so that's kind of uh, what we've been looking at as far as the people that could uh, have an impact on what Connect 2022 looks like. Let's talk about the places uh, that will impact where we are. And when I think about places, I think about connected places, places connected together. Out of the latest uh, Internet Trends Report, 39% of the world is now on the Internet. And again, that is distributed differently ac across different parts of the world. What we start seeing in more established Internet markets, so places where the Internet has been around for a long time, is that we're seeing uh, this shift from the Internet providing really utilitarian things to consumer grade experiences even at work. I love this, this tweet from Aaron Levy. He's uh, the CEO of Box.net, a cloud storage company that has really embraced uh, the enterprise in that uh, company. He says uh, enterprise software used to be about making existing work more efficient. Now the opportunity is for software to transform the work itself. Yeah. I, I totally agree to that, and to, to put some, some context to that, a really good example of how enterprise-grade applications went from, from enterprise to consumer-grade applications is if you, if you think back three or four years ago and you wanted to have corporate email on your mobile phone, so the incumbent device to have that on, what would that be? The BlackBerry, right? So when the iPhone came, they, would, they could off, also offer email on the mobile device, but it could do so much more. So the enterprise-grade application, corporate email, became just a feature of a consumer-grade mobile device. Yeah, it's some, some really interesting stuff happening in that space, and you've heard about that uh, over the last day and a half of things that we're doing at Sabre that we'll address in just a minute. But I, I don't want to only focus on those established markets. Uh, Areas that we find really interesting, especially when we talk about internet adoption, is India. So India is currently the third largest connected country by number of people. It's also the fastest growing uh, by internet subscriptions. And what's fascinating about India is this is happening on mobile. Over 65% of the internet traffic is done via a mobile device. Yeah, I'm, I'm also really fascinated by the fact. And I've, I've actually experienced that firsthand in, in in a few of our markets in Europe, Middle East, and Africa, especially the Middle East, the, the mobile penetration is just amazing. And they have actually gone from not having internet at all to have a mobile device connected to the internet. So a lot of these people that have internet-connected mobile device, they don't, have, they don't even have internet connected on, on landlines at home on their desktops. So, then when I think about, oh, should we, uh, what kind of applications should we develop for the Middle East? It's not desktop because, you know, most people won't have an internet connection. So who can use the desktop applications, right? Yeah, really interesting. And what we find is that where the usage is, the money follows. Uh, so over 40% uh, of internet e-commerce in India is done via a mobile device today. Yeah, and um, a couple of weeks ago, I attended a Gartner conference around mobile trends and also internet trends. And they predict that in three years, in 2018, 
85% of all consumer engagements with brands will be from a mobile device. Wow. So we're bringing this back, what does this mean uh, for business travel? The first thing I think it's important to talk about is that the applications that we build as Sabre that you use need to be consumer grade. And that's a, a message that you're hearing more and more for us. It's, it's work that we're doing and it's work that I'm excited about because I want when you sit down to work, I want it to be just as good as an experience as when you pull out your tablet at home and start surfing around the internet and do shopping that way. And I think that we're making great strides in that direction. But it also means that we partner together to make sure the end traveler has those same type of experiences. And I think that we'll see that more and more over the coming years. Yeah, and not only, it's not only about the nice and flashy things, Mark. You know, the devices, the GUIs, the user interfaces. Because if we want to create all these nice and shiny, really good user experiences, that needs to be you know, found all the way back to the backend. I'm a, a previous backend developer, so I'm very passionate about backends. And that's why I also love the fact that Sabre has really taken a really good uh, action on that. And, and uh, last year, we released Sabre Dev Studio. And all the new APIs that we are releasing today are what we call REST-based, and, and that the payloads coming back comes in a format called JSON, which is optimized for mobile consumption uh, from the beginning, and also um, very much consumable by desktop applications or what have you. Now, Joe knows I'm a former developer too, so when he starts talking APIs, we start wanting to geek out a little bit, and that's good because we're gonna start talking about the technology uh, that affects our world between now and 2022. So the first ones we'll look at is some you've heard a little bit about today, at smartwatches, voice, and biometrics. So smartwatches, uh, we look at, we've been wearing smartwatches for a while uh, in the lab, about a year and a half to two years, different versions, different kinds, and we find some common themes across them. The first is glanceable information, uh, this idea that you can look and quickly uh, gather information that you would normally get from your phone. You check your phone sometimes between, depending on what study you read, 150 to 250 times a day. Most of those are for less than two seconds. If you think about moving those onto the wrist, you're looking at your watch maybe 100 times a day, and that becomes interesting very quickly as a device. I know the first weekend that I had my uh, Apple Watch, um, I only pulled my phone out of my pocket on a Saturday twice um, the whole day, and one of those, embarrassingly enough, was to check the time. Uh, <laughs> some things are just... And you know, Mark, Mark I, I, I gotta uh, say something here, because you, know, you, you talk about glanceable information, and you know, I, I wanted to sort of be knowing something about that, so I read up on that. So glanceable information is using what you call the pre-attentive capabilities of your brain, which means that you can glance at something, um, checking the time, for example, and still continue to do what you do in the foreground. So like I'm talking to you, and I can, I can register the time and still continue whatever I was doing. Did you know that? I did, so we've got a little bit of neuroscience happening, your daily dose of neuroscience today at Connect. <laughs> so the next thing we, th we think about with, uh, with these watches is I think of a a term that Apple has used, continuity. Um, I like this idea, uh, Android and Google have talked about as well, as well, is that you do things on different devices and your activity moves with you. So you may start shopping on your desktop, pick it up later on your tablet, put it on hold, and then get an alert that your hold's fixing to expire on your watch and push the button that says book now. So this idea that you'll do things across multiple devices, people are already doing them, they're just starting from scratch every time they pick up a new device. Uh, so we will see great progression in making that easier to do across the various platforms. And the, the third piece that we look at is this voice. Uh, this idea of uh, these screens are very small, they're fairly hard to touch, and so many of the interactions that we do are gonna be moving towards uh, talking to these devices and having them talk back to us. But voice is only a piece of what I'm excited about on these devices. The biometric piece, I'm gonna take my heart rate right now. Um, before I came on stage, 
It was about 126 beats per minute. That's a little high. That's not my resting heart rate. I was I cooler. I was 113. Yeah, Joe's, limit. Joe's not as nervous or in better shape. We're not sure. <laughs> um, Let's not go in there. And so what I, find, what I find fascinating about these devices is that the first weekend I had my, uh, my watch that was taking my heart rate, I had more heart rate readings in that weekend because it was doing it every hour in the background than I'd had in my whole life <laughs> leading up to it. And yeah. so I'm, I'm now very aware of my biometrics, and I think there's some travel applications we've been considering. Yeah, so um, when all these, all these sort of activity trackers came out, I started thinking, how can we, as I said in the beginning, I get the devices, I get to try them, I get to wear them, and then ultimately my boss expects me to think, how can we take this again into travel and create applications around it? So I thought about a use case. Let's say that you have an Apple Watch. It measures your movement when you sleep. It measures your blood pressure, your heart rate, and everything. Let's say that this, information, this biometric information is sent to or shared with one of the applications, the travel applications that you have. So let's assume that that's trip case. If that information then is shared with a hotel, the hotel would know that I probably didn't sleep very well last night. And by knowing so, they can push me a message to say, we believe that you didn't have a good night's sleep. So to compensate for that, we would like to offer you 50% of our nicest breakfast package. So being really relevant, because I mean, I didn't sleep well, and then I feel sort of special and I feel seen, and I would probably take that option. That's, that's a great service-driven example of using biometrics. We also talk a little bit about security. Uh, the logo here is a company called NIMI uh, that does your heart rate signature and gives you a band that can unlock your phone or your car or your house based on having the device on that's verifying that you are. But you touched on something that I think is interesting, the sharing of biometric data. I know many of you in the room have a hard time even getting in your traveler's GPS location. Can you imagine asking them for your heart rate? Can I have your heart rate while you're traveling? That would really help us out a lot. <laughs> or for me, getting the email from, from Maryland at Sabre and saying, hey, Mark, your resting heart rate's been a little high in the three weeks leading up to Connect. We're afraid that you're not going to be able to make that trip because you're a liability to us. So we, we see this, this question of sharing data, again, happens not just on location today. It'll happen on biometrics in the future. It continues to happen as we share more data. Yeah, and I'm not so sure that, you know, Generation Zero, that's going to be a problem for them. Because if you think about the stuff that these guys post on the internet, come on. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, you know, integrity, knowing, you know, sending my location, where am I? What am I doing? They are doing that uh, anyway. So you can, you can data mine where they are, first of all. And then secondly, biometric data. I don't think they're going to you know, mind if they share it with someone. Because as I said before, it's not about you and I, what we feel uncomfortable with. It's what this generation is all about. And, and I, I think that you know, it's not going to be a problem. Okay. Well, well, we'll see how that ends up playing out over for Connect 2022. If we ask for your heart rate on the way into the conference, then you'll know how that ended up playing out. But I want us to get through a few more technologies to talk about. Uh, the next set is augmented reality and virtual reality. Augmented reality is this idea that you wear some kind of headset or device, could be even as small as a contact, and its job is to put digital things on top of the real world. So I love this conference example. We're all here, here at a conference. You're all wearing badges. Can you imagine if those badges were enabled with some kind of Bluetooth that you could opt in to start broadcasting your LinkedIn profile, let's say? And so I could look at someone like Joe with this device on, and I could see Joe's name above it. <laughs> I could see where he worked, and I could see to avoid him because of my email history with him. No, 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 Mark. That would really be a red that. halo on top yeah. of my head. So this is, uh, the one we have up here is the Microsoft HoloLens, uh, which is kind of the most public one right now. And what's interesting about this is if you uh, search online and look at the video demos they are doing, they are looking at several travel use cases for how this gets used and integrate uh, travel uh, scenarios and information into the physical world. Yeah, and you know, when we talk about augmented reality, it's not only the technology itself that is exciting because now we have the three biggest IT companies in the world 
in this arena. So we have Microsoft, we have Google, and just this week there was a rumor that Apple actually bought an augmented reality company. So I think we'll see a definite acceleration in the evolution of this really, really nice technology. And, and even right before we came on stage, I was looking through my Twitter stream, and a, a company called Magic Leap, which Google has a large investment in, announced their um, augmented reality developer platform uh, today for developers to start building uh, device uh, experiences that are used by these types of devices. So very interesting time that's moving very quickly. So we talked about three of what some people call the four horsemen, Facebook, wasn't mentioned, but Facebook owns a company called Oculus Rift, which does virtual reality, the full immersive um, experience of a, of a world created in front of you. Yeah, and I think that th they're not going to be sort of threatened by augmented reality, because to me, and I, I think you agree as well, Mark, that augmented reality and virtual reality are two different things. So previously, virtual reality was all about creating virtual worlds, virtual people, and you did the hardest work to make it look as real as possible. Now, what Mark and I see the trend is that it's completely different now because it's not about virtual stuff. It's about real people, real places, however you go there virtually. So I have a pretty cool example of how they sort of piloted this technology in, in the context of travel. So this Team C in the UK, they ran a project where they said to all their travel agents, we want you to try to upsell every single customer that comes in and buys a long-haul flight. So most of them would come in and, and request an um, economy flight. So after about one month, they would come up with a result that they managed to sell to one out of 100 customers an, uh, an upgrade, so from economy to uh, premium economy. Now, the second part of the test was to the same to, to, to the new customers that would come in and ask for um, long-haul flights. They would actually invite them to sit down on a chair and say, hey, Mr. Customer or Mrs. Customer, this is an economy seat. So it stops here, and when the person in front of you tilts it, you're going to have something in your face. And then, Mr. Customer, here is the economy seat. It's really nice. You know, the, the table is down, there's a glass of champagne, there is a canopy. Now, by just running or letting their customers experience the difference between economy and premium economy, they would now sell to two persons out of 100. Not, you know, it might not seem big, but it's still a 100% increase. And that really tells me the opportunities of using virtual reality in travel by enriching Maybe the sales. Yeah, we, we look a lot at, at virtual reality not replacing travel at all, but enhancing pre travel experiences, giving you an opportunity uh, to communicate with your travelers to understand what they're looking for and why they think it's important. We have a VR headset in the ideation lounge. If you haven't been by uh, to try it on, we usually find it pairs well with the happy hour. So have a drink, try on virtual reality. <laughs> it's a really good time. We're going to move back into the real world talk about autonomous cars, the Internet of Things, and personalization. I, I bought a vehicle last year. I bought a Jeep last year. I love my Jeep. And, but I, I sat in it the first time, and I thought, is this the last gasoline vehicle I ever buy? And then I thought, is this the last vehicle I ever drive myself around in? Mark, that is deep, dude. <laughs> and so I, you see this happening more and more. It's not as existential as maybe it sounds, is that high-end car makers are definitely anything that's par uh, parking assist, lane change assist, any of these features are moving towards autonomous cars that drive themselves. In fact, Tesla uh, has a car they've been driving autonomously on the highway from uh, San Francisco to Seattle now, uh, well enough that they feel like they want to push that software update out to the, all of their vehicles this summer to allow them to be able to do that on the highway. So how would they... How would they update software in the car? Would they come out with a computer and connect it to no, the car? No, you know it's all wireless, all connected. All, all connected, all connected, cool. Yeah. So let's then talk about IoT or Internet of Things. So the, the self-driven cars are, are a really cool example of an, a very advanced IoT device. Now, in the, in the race between human and machine, for the first time in history, the machine are taking over. 
because there are now more than 7 billion devices connected to the internet. And Gartner, again, they forecast that in five years, in 2020, there will be more than 30 billion devices connected oh, to the devices. internet. And, and I have a really cool use case, again, around uh, the usage of IoT. So this pest control company called rent -a kill they're experts in, in killing pests. Killing. So they kill rats and mice and everything. They have invented internet-connected mouse traps. So, for example, Wembley Arena in London, they have hundreds or thousands of internet-connected mice traps. And, and the advantage of that is that no longer do they have to send people out and walk around the whole arena just to see if there are dead mice in the traps, because they know exactly on a dashboard which traps have mice, so they can send the people out to the mouse traps that actually have dead mice in them to collect them. It's, it's a really cool example. I, besides building a better mouse trap, like literally, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about uh, Internet of Things because as my home becomes more connected, that's become, that becomes part of my profile of things that I like, and I want that profile to travel with me. I want whenever I get to my hotel that it knows from my Nest thermostat at home that I like it at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and when I walk into my hotel room, it's integrated with that. The lights are integrated. My sleep number bed is communicated to their sleep number bed, and so I have this, I have this seamless experience even when I travel. That's one of the reasons I'm excited about kind of the, the infrastructure and even the idea around uh, that we, we've been promoting around uh, Sabre profiles, that this place where you can store this information. And while it's not IoT ready yet, because these aren't um, at to that mass adoption stage, I do believe that the central idea of being able to store traveler preferences makes a big difference once you start having so many connected devices that learn about what you do and what you like to do. Yeah, and again, we're, uh, we're um, accustomed to talk about the device itself. But you know, f in order for these devices to operate, Again, you need a backend. You need a, a smart backend. And, and the, the advantage of having a connection to the internet is that you can have fairly dumb devices because they can take advantage of all the computing power in the cloud. So I think that we'll see a combination of very intelligent devices as the Google self-driven car that is connected to the internet, but also much more simple devices that could just serve as an input and output device. One of those simple devices are iBeacons. We have been experimenting with iBeacons in the labs. We know that we've seen several use cases and travel around those as well. Uh, we have an experiment in the ideation lounge. If you haven't seen that, we've been playing with an, the analytics side of gathering information of how people move through spaces using these devices. But dumb devices aren't as fun to talk about as smart devices. And what tech presentation is complete without talking about a little bit of robots? Um, so let's talk about robotics and travel. Uh, we think about robotics and travel in three ways. The first way is operational. So these are robots that do things for us. They could be carrying your bag. They could be pouring you a drink. This is the robotic bartender in Quantum of the Seas from Royal Caribbean. You go and punch your drink into the iPad, and these <laughs> two robot arms go to work making your drink. I don't know why we build robots with only two arms, though. I have a problem with this. So if you're a robot manufacturer, eight at least. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, the, the second way we think about uh, robotics is conversational robots. So uh, you have rudimentary versions of these uh, on, on your phone. But these are robots that you can talk to and talk back to you. Um, kind of much as we start getting past this kind of ask-answer stage, and ask and maybe ask some more for some more information and then reply. These are the types of conversations I think we'll be having with devices. We have a device in the ideation lounge from Amazon called the Amazon Echo. You can ask it to play music. The coolest thing they pushed out within the last couple of weeks is that you can ask it to order something that's in your order history. And so if you come by, we'll order some diapers um, together just using our voice in the Amazon Echo. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I see you have the Jibo robot in the picture, and, and this is all emerging technologies. And you know, both me and Mark is we are I want it now, both of us, I think. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is coming when? Uh, 2016, first quarter of 2016. 2016. So are oh, we going to have to wait for a year, probably? Yeah, that's right. And the Jibo is out of the uh, out of MIT, and it's if you look up the videos at J J I O, <coughs> they're just amazing of the interactions. Yeah. And now, 
while we have to wait for the gyro, there are actually devices out there, not necessarily robots, but there are actually toys out there. There is a Barbie doll now that is connected to the internet. It's called Hello Barbie. Now listen to this. Hello Barbie has a built-in Wi-Fi chip. So your child can actually communicate with a Barbie doll. The sound file is sent over the internet to the application servers, it's, uh, it's parsed, and then it's determined what is the best response. This is so cool that the parents can actually sign up for a digest to replay what the child has been talking to their doll about. It's re really interesting. So how long until your kid starts asking Barbie how much it is to go on vacation is really, really a question we're, we're starting to consider. The last one here uh, we, is called recreational robots. Uh, so this idea, especially in the drone uh, realm of follow me robots, so you'll put a device on you and you can throw, this is the lily um, that should be out later this year and it will follow you around if you're a snowboarder or a hiker. It will follow you and take pictures of you and video your whole um, excursion. As we start to see the blend of business and leisure travel, you could start to see uh, the, type, the business traveler demographic be interested in this. There's also a, a tripod version that Joe has been talking about that, uh, we, that will sit here and uh, look at your tracker and then follow you around. He calls it the ultimate selfie machine. Yeah, well, I call it the ultimate <laughs> alpha machine because I have just a slight concern about the, the drones that are flying all over <laughs> us. Because as they turn, they will actually photograph people that don't necessarily want to be photographed. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting consideration. So we hope that's given you a glimpse into to some of the things we're thinking about of the future of travel. But I, what I want you to take away most importantly is that the future of travel is not something that happens to us. It's something that we make. That's why we love being at these events because uh, the conversations that you have today are what shape the future of travel. And I want you to feel that this, these are things that, that, yes, we need to consider, but we need to figure out how we work together to make these things a part of the travel future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you guys. Um, I got to say, I think my sales team wants those augmented uh, reality glasses for GBTA with the LinkedIn profile. It will help us uh, find the right buyers. Um, and I want the robot to help me work on uh, mid-year DPMs for performance reviews uh, for, uh, for, my, for my team. So just to recap a couple of things uh, from uh, this morning's general session. First of all, thank you again uh, to our panel who really helped us think a little bit about uh, personalization, globalization, and wellness. Um, Wade Jones, who was up here, um, and Shelly Terry talked a little bit about uh, billion dollar numbers. So Wade talked about a billion dollars that Sabre invests every year in technology. Um, and we marry that up with very flexible platforms, global capability, scale, it sits behind a talented pool of employees spread across the globe. Um, and our goal is not just to compete better, it's really to differentiate ourselves and solve your business problems. So a billion dollars in spend is going in to helping you guys be successful in your travel programs, with your uh, travel products, uh, and we really look forward to helping you uh, achieve those goals. Uh, Shelly said, um, just in one O&D alone, 3.6 million different flight options, or fare options, excuse me, um, and getting those down to the one right option for the one traveler in less than one second. Um, and so that kind of double backflip that we do every single time somebody does a shopping entry, now just got a double twist added to the backflip every time we have to think about branded fares and paid seats. Um, but we're putting the platforms in place that make it work for our supplier partners as they think about how to merchandise and personalize their offerings, and we want to make it uh, able to work for our travel agencies who have to process uh, and, and help sell those tickets, and also to our travel buyers uh, as they think about the right options uh, for, for their employees. Uh, yesterday, we also talked about a billion API transactions that Sabre does every day on those open systems with scale globally. So pretty big numbers. We invest a lot in you. Um, uh, and of course, we invest a lot in a conference like this. So thank you again for spending. I'm not sure it's the billions of seconds. Uh, but certainly, thank you for the probably the millions of seconds that you spent with us uh, over the next, uh, next couple of days. 
Uh, just moving on, a couple of uh, housekeeping items. So after this session, we have lunch, I think, just across the door. So uh, look forward to hosting you for lunch today. Uh, after lunch, we have desserts served in our solution showcase. It's where we were last night for the opening reception, so just across the hall over here. Um, after lunch and dessert, we have our workshops. If you haven't downloaded uh, the app, uh, the event app, please do that. It tells you where all your workshops are. I think we've got, uh, at least I know on the, on the corporate side, uh, three different rotations of workshops. So uh, make sure you get the app to know where each of the workshops are. Uh, this evening, uh, we have Connect After Dark. Uh, so it's downstairs in the Cherry Lounge. Cherry Red, Saber Red, Red Rock Hotel. Should be easy to find. Uh, I think just inside this, the casino. So uh, certainly don't get lost with all the excitement, uh, and we hope to see you uh, this evening uh, for Connect After Dark. Tomorrow, uh, we've got breakfast in the morning, uh, same locations as today. Uh, and then uh, in our general session tomorrow, we look forward to hearing from uh, Tom Klein, our president and C CEO. Tom's gonna be talking a little bit about his vision of Sabre and his perspective on the travel industry. And then we'll pivot to Tony Shea, uh, CEO of Zappos. Uh, Zappos is here locally in Las Vegas. Tony's going to talk a little bit about culture, uh, the customer service culture that Zappos has put in place, uh, and how that's really shaped the, the uh, trajectory that Zappos is on. Uh, and then separately, how he's taken a lot of those cultural elements and applied them to, I think, one of his focal areas, which is how to rejuvenate downtown uh, Las Vegas. So, Again, thank you for uh, all your um, engagement this morning. I hope you've enjoyed the general session. Enjoy lunch uh, and the workshops this afternoon. Thank you.